Welcome to Martha Runs the World, a podcast about running, fitness, and all things health-related. I'm Martha Hughes, your host, and each week I'll introduce a new episode that is of interest to all runners. Hi, and welcome to episode 278 of Martha Runs the World. Today, I'm talking all about one of the three major American trails, the Pacific Crest Trail. There are three major long-distance trails in the U.S. There are other trails as well that are long-distance. There are a few that aren't ready yet, that aren't developed fully and are being uh, put together. But the ones that are kind of put together are the American Discovery Trail and the North Country Trail, the Great American Rail Trail, they're all being put together. There's another one too. I've forgotten about, I've forgotten what it's called, but they're all being put together, but they're not considered one of the three major long distance trails. The three major ones are the Appalachian Trail, the Pacific Crest Trail, and the Continental Divide Trail. I talked about the Appalachian Trail already in an episode previously, so I will include a link to that episode in the show website, martharunsaworld.com. One of the greatest American trails is the Pacific Crest Trail, and it's considered one of the gems of the West. It, it is such an incredible, magnificent living monument, and it shows what can happen if people get together who have vision and set out to do what they see in their hearts. It's nearly impossible to pinpoint the first person to propose the Pacific Crest Trail, but the historic facts I looked up give credit to the following people. Catherine Montgomery at the State Normal School in Bellingham, Washington, a former supervisor of recreation for the U.S. Forest Service, Fred W. Cleator, and Clinton C. Clark of Pasadena, California. According to author and mountaineer Joseph T. Hazard, Catherine Montgomery suggested the idea of a border-to-border trail to him in 1926. Fred Cleator, who oversaw the Pacific Northwest region of the Forest Service, outlined Oregon's Skyline Trail, which was a big link for the PCT in 1920, and extended that trail to Oregon's north and south borders. Cleator also initiated plans for a similar trail in Washington. Clinton Clark, founder of the Pasadena Playhouse and chairman of the Mountain League of Los Angeles, however, is often called the father of the PCT because he organized the Pacific Crest Trail System Conference in 1932 to promote the concept of a border-to-border trail. Under Clark's inspiration, the Pacific Crest Trail System Conference which made up a federation of hiking clubs and youth groups devoted itself to developing an interconnected system of existing trails and new trails that would extend all the way from Canada to Mexico on or close to the crest of the mountainous western states. This was not a new idea, but unifying the many hiking groups from the cause for the cause was... The members of the conference included the Boy Scouts, YMCA, Sierra Club, the Los Angeles County Department of Recreation, California Alpine Club, Mountaineers of Seattle, and many others. Clark served as president of the conference for 25 years. Renowned nature photographer Ansel Adams was a member of the executive committee. At the time, six segments of the system were already completed, that included the Cascade Crest Trail in Washington, Oregon Skyline Trail in Oregon, Lava Crest Trail in Northern California, Tahoe Yosemite Trail in California, and the John Muir Trail in California, and the Desert Crest Trail in Southern California. Clark recruited the Civilian Conservation Corps, CCC, members to help plan and build remaining trail links, bridges, and structures. In the years of the Great Depression in the 1930s, the federal government set up the CCC, the Civilian Conservation Corps, to do many outdoor projects throughout the country. It was a volunteer workforce made up of men ages 18 to 25 unmarried. These men worked for minimal wage around $25 a month to work many necessary projects, including flood control, irrigation, building trails, fire prevention, tree planting, 
landscape, mosquito control, and many other necessary but very difficult jobs. Clark also organized the YMCA PCT relays held during the summers of 1935 through 1938. During these relays, 40 teams of young hikers, ages 14 to 18, under the direction of a young YMCA outdoorsman named Warren Rogers, scouted a route for the trail. The hikers carried a logbook north from Campo on the Mexican border, recording their adventures and route. On August 5, 1938, the final relay team reached mile post 78 on the Canadian border. And then skip ahead to 1965 when President Lyndon B. Johnson called for development and protection of a balanced system of trails to help protect and enhance the total quality of the outdoor environment. And soon after, the Secretary of of the Interior, Stuart L. Udall, requested the Bureau of Outdoor Recreation to take the lead of a nationwide trail study. The results were documented in a volume entitled Trails for America and was published in December 1966. The National Trails System came out of it in 68, and the Act established policies and procedures for a nationwide system of trails, and the Appalachian Trail and Pacific Crest Trail was, were designated as the nation's first national scenic trails. The Pacific Crest Trail spans 2,650 miles from Mexico to Canada through California, Oregon, and Washington. It's a national scenic trail, as stated above. It reveals the beauty of the desert, unfolds the glaciated expanses of the Sierra Nevada, travels deep forests, and provides commanding vistas of the volcanic peaks in the Cascade Range. You can decide to through hike, which means you hike the entire trail at once, which will take a few months, or you can section hike, doing day hikes a few days or a couple weeks. You can trail run for a few hours or a few days. It's really up to you. Now, the Appalachian Trail is known as the Green Tunnel. See my past episode on the AT. The environment is pretty similar through the entire trail. The PCT has many distinct environs, and I'll break them down for you. Here are the different sections you'll come across if you decide to either through hike or section hike. It's just a remarkably different trail depending on where you decide to go. There's so much variation. Now, the Southern California begins at Campo, which is right at the Mexican border. So it's very, very dry, very, very desert, very flat. First passes through Lake Moreno County Park, and then it goes through Chaparral and Scrub, the Laguna Mountains, which is peaks and very dry. And then the trail dips into Anzo Borrego Desert State Park. And if you're a through hiker, you're going to start there in the spring. If it's a low snow year, you're going to start early. If it's a high snow year, you're going to start later because you don't want to hit the Sierra Nevadas too early because you'll be stuck because of too much snow. But if it's a low snow year, you can start earlier. You really have to pay attention to the weather and how much snow there is because you want to start in the desert as early as you can because it gets very, very warm. Now, once you get through Anza Borrego, then you'll hit the winds through San Felipe Hills and Cleveland National Forest, which is where you'll find your first pine trees. And then you start climbing the San Jacinto Mountains, which at its highest point is 9,000 feet. And it's really, really cool environment. Even that part isn't all desert. You're going to find mountains. And if you, like I said, if you go too early, even at um, San Jacinto Mountains, you will find snow if you go too early. So you really have to plan it out properly and you have to pay attention to what the weather is like during that part. If there's too much snow in San Jacinto, you'll get in trouble. And hikers, through hikers and day hikers and trail runners all have gotten into trouble by not paying attention to the weather and what the snow levels are like. You got to really, really watch that. All right, from there, the Pacific Crest Trail climbs steeply to the crest of the San Bernardino and San Gabriel Ranges, and then there's lots of forest shade. And then you get to Big Bear Lake and Lake Arrowhead. And there, if you want to take a day off, a zero day as 
the through hikers call it. You can take a day off and relax, get some pizza, get some junk food, <laughs> whatever you want. And then you go to a mountain Baden Powell and the Angeles Crest National Scenic Byway. And there's a great 100 mile um, race that takes place right along there, in, but not at that time of year. But it really depends on where, what time of year you're there. And then the, uh, then it goes through the San Andreas fault zone and into the Mojave desert, which is really, really dry and hot. And then you go through that, which of course is probably always windy. It's very, very windy there most of the year. And if you watch any videos of through hikers, you'll see the wind. You just see it. And that's a really, really wide crossing. So sometimes they have to camp out near some of those windmills, those electronic windmills, those big giant ones. And you can hear the sound and you can feel the wind. <laughs> I mean, that's why the windmills are there, right? <laughs> because it's windy. <laughs> and then they go through the Tehachapi Mountains. Tehachapi is actually a really cool town. So if you can take a zero day or spend the spend the night there before you go and you want to go on a day hike or some trail running. It's a really neat area, especially if you don't go in the summertime where it's really hot, go in the spring or the fall. It's a really neat area to check out. Now, Walker Pass is considered the end of the Southern California area. And I know from the through hiking videos that I've seen is that once a once the backpackers get to Kennedy Meadows, that's considered the start of the Sierra Nevada mountains. So that is the end of the Southern California section. Now, the Central California section is at Kennedy Meadows, and there is a big section there for through hikers. There's a big, there's a little town, it's a little store and a little area to camp for all the backpackers that go there. And they're very friendly to through hikers. And you can get food there. You can have supplies shipped there if you're going out for the whole trail. If you're going out for a few days, you could probably have something shipped there if you need that. But it looks like a really neat area to stop and to take a day off, take a zero day. It's a nice place to stop. Just north of that is Sequoia National Park, which, of course, is amazingly beautiful. You'll start seeing the pine trees. You'll see the conifer forests. And then you'll get to about 4,000 feet. And then at Sequoia National Park, you run into the John Muir Trail. And many of the through hikers had already put in... Um, requests the lottery service, of course, where you go to, to hike up to Mount Whitney. Now you have to do that ahead of time and you have to put in the date that you're going to be there. So you have to pretty well be sure that you're going to reach that point at that date to be able to hike up to Mount Whitney. So it can be difficult to get that pass to get up to Mount Whitney. It's sometimes not easy depending on how many people are trying to do it. But if you want to try to do that, you can do that. And then from Mount Whitney to Yosemite is the uh, John Muir Trail is part of the Pacific Crest Trail. So they go together. So if you're on there, you will see a lot more hikers and a lot more trail runners, a lot more backpackers on that section of trail. And depending on if it's a snow year, a heavy snow year or a light snow year, it might be more difficult or not to reach some of the passes. Some of the passes may be closed if you go too early. And you'll reach higher passes. Forester Pass is 13,000 feet. So you want to be very careful about going up there too early. After crossing Highway 108 of Sonora Pass, which is about 9,600 feet, the trail becomes subalpine, relatively level traverse that stays close to the Sierra Crest until you get to Interstate 80, which is about 7,000 feet. And there's volcanic rock, and this is north of Yosemite. And I've been on this part of the trail. I love this part. It's really, really cool. Volcanic rock formations are there. It's really pretty. You can see a lot of wildlife. The plants in this section include the corn li lily, snow plant, red fir, ponderosa pines. And then some of the animals you'll see are marmots, coyote, deer, and you might be lucky enough to see black bear. Some of the birds are mountain chickadee, junco, stellar's jays, nutcrackers, red-tailed hawks. Once you get kind of towards, I, I would say past Lake Tahoe, you get to Northern California section. So north of Donner Summit, about 7,900 feet, 
I've been on this section too. This is really cool. Old volcanic flows and sediment bury most of the ancient bedrock. And once you get past the north of the Feather River, the Sierra Nevada yields to the Southern Cascade Range, and the plants include lupin, painbrush, larkspur, columbine, gooseberry, and manzanita. Animals include rac- raccoon, marten, mink, badger, fox, bobcat, and of course deer and black bear. As you go up farther, you get towards Mount Lassen, and you can see Mount Lassen really well. It's a really pretty area. You won't see it nearly as many people in this part of California that you would down towards Yosemite and Tahoe. It's very, very remote. It's also a really beautiful part of California. So I suggest visiting it. Even if you're not on the trail, just go up there and go to to Mount Lassen National Park because it's really beautiful part of California. It's one of the prettiest, I think. Um, North of the park, you go towards uh, Hat Creek and then out towards Mount Shasta, which is one of my favorite parts of of the state. And then it turns, and then the Pacific Crest Trail goes west, and you can see Mount Shasta. It goes towards Castle Craig State Park, which is really, really cool state park. I, I would like to do much more hiking in there. And it also goes into the Trinity Alps Wilderness, which is really nice. The trail reaches 76 100 feet in the mountains and connects with the Cascade Range there. And then you got you start going towards Oregon and towards the Siskiyou Mountains and the Klamath River. And then you get into Oregon. From there you get into the Siskiyou Summit and in southern Oregon and it gets a little drier right there. It's not southern Oregon is not like northern Oregon. It's very dry. This part of Oregon is very remote. There aren't a whole lot of people there. And you can start seeing a different volcanic mountains. For the most part, they're inactive. You can probably see uh, Diamond Peak, the Three Sisters, Mount Washington, Mount Jefferson, and Mount Hood. And it, it's pretty dry in this part of the state. It's also very, very scenic. And the chief attraction in Oregon, as you get farther north, is Mount Hood. That's 11,000 feet. 200 feet. Oregon's largest, and this is an active volcano. Heavy precipitation in the section produces dense, shady firs dominated by Douglas, Silver, and Noble firs at lower elevations. And so this part of the state tends to get more rain than the southern part. Northern part of Oregon is way different than southern part. You can see um, animals include mice, squirrels, beaver, fox, deer, and elk. And there's lots of songbirds. And then you get to the division of Washington and Oregon states. And Washington section begins at the Bridge of the Gods and the Columbia River, which is uh, so, so picturesque. It's really, really breathtaking. It's so pretty. Once you're on the other side of the river there, you have a steady climb outside uh, to get up over the gorge. And then you're in this mountainous area of Washington State. You'll see Mount Adams, which is at 12,200 feet. And you will be uh, in, in the rugged Goat Rocks wilderness. And there's lots and lots of mountains in here. And it's pretty rough hiking, pretty rough trail running, but it's beautiful. You probably won't even mind it that much. There's lots of passes you have to get through. They're pretty steep and high. The Cascades are pretty tough. You'll see Mount Rainier at 14,400 feet. The Chinook Pass is Snoqualmie Pass are pretty tough passes, but you'll get through them. And the Cascade offers many challenges. The PCT climbs up a deep canyon to a high mountain pass only to descend another deep canyon and repeat. So wash and repeat. (laughs) There's lots of alpine lakes and the the wilderness is absolutely beautiful, just so beautiful. And then you get through the all these passes, and then the highest is located only eight miles before the border. And then once you get to the border, you're done. <laughs> all right. Now, there are lots of records held for the fastest known times of traversing the Pacific Crest Trail. 
And that's really a fun, fun thing to know for us trail runners. You can be a backpacker and just take your time and do it in a few months. Sure. Or you could be one of these crazy fast and slow time people and do it in a few days <laughs> or a few weeks. The male supported fastest known time is held by Carol Saab in 46 days, 12 hours and 50 minutes. And he did that on August 26th of 2023. The second fastest known time was Timothy Olson, who did it in 51 days, 16 hours and 55 minutes on July 22nd of 2021. Now, the self-supported male, Josh Perry, did it in 55 days, 16 hours, 54 minutes, and he did that August 7th of 2022. Now, the female, there's only been a self-supported, Heather Anderson, and she did it in 60 days, 17 hours, 12 minutes in uh, August 7th of 2013. What's the difference between supported and self-supported? Well, supported has a whole crew. They meet you at probably the different passes that they can get through. You may sleep in the van for it, take naps. They change your shoes for you. They get you fed. They take care of you. Self-supported means you do everything yourself. Sure, you may have drops at different locations. You may be able to do that, but you have to take care of everything yourself. That's fully on self-supported. That's what that means. There's a handful of crazy, crazy people who do different adventures on the PCT. There's a thing called a yo-yo. They do it up and back. Why? I don't know. <laughs> they just do it. There's been um, two different people who do it yo-yo style, meaning they do twice the distance. And they're both self-supported. The male yo-yoer, Scott Williamson, he did it in 191 days, one hour and 20 minutes. On October 1st, 2006, the self-supported female, Olive McGloin, did it in 195 days in November 5th, 2014. Now, this is almost as crazy, if not crazier, in winter. There's a team of two two gentlemen who did it, self-supported, in winter. I can't even imagine doing that whole trail in winter. Justin Lichtner and Sean Forey did it 132 days, March 1st, 2015. That's insanity to me. Can you imagine? Can you imagine doing that in winter? Now, if you want to go on the PCT yourself, if you want to do a day hike, if you want to go overnight, maybe do some fast packing. I'll do a whole show on fast packing in the future too, by the way. If you want to go backpack, if you are psyched to do your own through hike or even just out for a couple of weeks, there are some things you need to know about the Pacific Crest Trail. And I will have a link for the PCT on the website so that you can see and you can see all the information you need. Um, there are some parts of it that you do that do require permits, even for day hiking. There's a couple places that you just have to sign up at the trailhead. Just put your name in and put the license plate of your car and blah, blah, blah on the trailhead and put it in the little box. There are some places that if you go overnight, you do have to sign up with the Forest Service beforehand. You have to do that stuff before you go. Usually, though, you're okay. There are some spots that you do have to do it, though. So. There are 33 places on the Pacific Crest Trail that have permit systems in place. So I would suggest looking for it ahead of time and making sure that you take care of business ahead of time if you have to. Just do your homework first before you go up. Just don't go up on a lark and say, oh, you know, Saturday morning, I think I'll do this. And then you find out you had to get a permit that Friday before you left. And they do this for a reason. They want to protect fragile areas from overuse and impact. They want to limit overcrowding and help to ensure a sense of solitude. And they want to attract visitors to make sure um, to secure funds and prioritize needed work. Because some of these places do get overused, especially the ones in, in higher density areas. Like I said, all that information can, will be on the website. Any other questions that you may have about camping in the area, what you need, backpacking, all that stuff, all that will be on the website. And there are certain trail closures, especially during times of year when there's fires, 
I should do a whole episode on wildfires and and the safety in wildfires. I will be doing that in the future as well. I've trail run and hiked a few miles on the PCT in California. Not that many, but a few. The first time was on a backpacking trip many, many years ago on the John Muir Trail near Yosemite. This was an out and back hike. We didn't do go that far. We were out for a little less than a week. I would say maybe five days. So it wasn't really that far. But it was back before backpacking gear was quite as high tech or comfortable as it is now. But it was really fun. It was a good time. And it was just really nice to be way up there in the High Sierra and to wake up next to this beautiful lake that we had and just to wake up and see just this glorious, glorious view of the Sierras and down and lower elevation. It was just absolutely stunning. And the last time I was up there, I I did some trail running on uh, part of the PCT near Donner Lake that I was at. It was very, very fun, very nice. And it, it was just really, really nice. I didn't need to register or anything like that. I just went up there and, and did this trail. There were a few people on the trail, but it was fun. It was very nice. Um, And it was good access. There was lots of parking, so that was fun. The Pacific Crest Trail holds a special place in my heart and always will. I will be back up there in the mountains this summer, in August, I believe, and I want to do a couple decent trail runs on the mountains because it's been a long time and I do miss them. I just never feel as peaceful or as at home as I do when I'm up on those trails. Nothing makes me feel as as nice or as good as I feel when I'm at least near the Sierra Nevadas. I don't know how to describe it except that It just makes me feel calm. So that is the Pacific Crest Trail. I hope that you get a chance to visit it sometime. I've only scratched the surface. I've never been to the Oregon or Washington parts of it. I do want to visit that someday. I also want to go in the desert and see some of that as well. I love the desert. I love visiting the desert. So that is also in my list of things to do. If you have any stories about about doing about running on the PCT or backpacking, please share them with me. And you can email me at Martha runs the world at gmail.com. I would love to hear it. I would love to share it on the show. That would be very, very fun. Everything is on the website at Martha runs the If you want to donate, it would be wonderful. It would really help out the show a lot. You can do that. You can become a Patreon patron. You can also just toss a couple bucks. If you want, there is the ability to do that. And you can also just leave a word or anything you want about the show. That would be terrific. That's it. And so thank you so much for joining me. So until next week, let's tie up our shoelaces and go for a run.